OK, so it's just turned midday, so I guess we can can start. Um, so welcome to the LCN lunchtime seminar. Our speaker today is Dr. Riley Green from the Department of Bioengineering, which Riley joined uh, in 2016. Her research is uh, broadly focused on deve developing medical electrodes, and particularly for neuroprosthetic applications. And to do that, she's bringing together a variety of technologies from biomaterials, tissue engineering, through uh, nanostructured um, synthetic materials and, and bionics. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Riley to give us uh, today's talk on nanostructured conductive polymer composites for bioelectronics. OK, thanks, Tony, and uh, thanks for having me um, in this uh, interesting days. It's good, actually, to get some in invited uh, opportunities to reach out and connect with people. Um, so my group actually um, has started very much in the neural interfaces space and been uh, expanding uh, ever since into sort of mainly any areas where we communicate with electroactive tissues. So um, this is just a bit of an example of the areas where we've developed projects um, from sort of coating electronic el electrodes to making electronics um, with different materials. We worked quite a bit, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> We've worked quite a bit in the space now of living bioelectronics, which is trying to hybridize cellular, cellular regenerative uh, systems with electronic uh, devices. And then a little bit of work in, in cardiac drug delivery and um, spinal cord bridges. Today, I'm just gonna uh, mainly focus on this area of flexible electronics and also in 3D uh, printed conductive polymers. So a bit of background as to why we ended up in this space is, um, that metal electrodes which have been historically used we would probably mostly be familiar with things like uh, cardiac pacemakers and cochlear implants um, they've all used platinum electrodes um, and platinum electrodes for um, stimulating tissue or recording uh, tissue activity um, whether it's in sort of the brain the ear the heart um, they've been really effective uh, and because they've been a really historical material, they continue to be used to this day. They are also known to be quite non-toxic. Um, it's quite well known that cochlear implants, if they do degrade, you end up with a lot of platinum embedded in the meninges of the brain, but it's known to still be quite well tolerated, so it's an acceptable risk. Um, the problems that we're having now is that we start to develop um, high-density uh, electrodes when you start to want to do very fine control of, of small numbers and singular cells, metals and specifically platinum can't actually deliver these um, stimulations or recordings from tissues. So they have a low charge injection limit and that's because metals communicate uh, with electrons, whereas the body and tissue cells communicate with ionic fluxes. And so there's always this transduction where you have the potential to create chemical reactions that can severely damage tissues or the electrodes themselves. Um, also being inorganic um, and usually quite smooth surfaces, they have um, a limited interaction with the target cells. They're tolerated but not actually integrated. And they also have a significantly stiffer um, mechanical property than, than the neural tissues, several orders of magnitude. Uh, platinum has gigapascals of stiffness. And neural tissues, depending on where they are in the body, are on the kilopascal scale from sort of singular kilopascals up to maybe about 100 at, at best in some of the stiffer spinal cord tissues. Um, so what people have done in this space is also look at the generation of, of scaffolds um, and can we create softer materials, materials that the tissues will interact with. Um, and so in the scaffold space, we've had um, a lot of hydrogels used, processable polymers, um, and the use of, of bioactive molecules such as growth factors, um, adhesion uh, matrix molecules. And in the scaffold space, we have all these lots of tools, lots of functionality to incorporate bits and pieces to try and tune tissue properties. But where we're talking with scaffolds, we're usually not talking about electronic devices. And so there's a, a lot of scaffold interactions that don't involve electrical stimulation, they don't involve electrically active materials. 
The space where we're focusing is actually where you bring those two things together. Can we get all of the good properties from um, biomaterials and scaffolds that have been developed over the past couple of decades and combine them with the great things that we know about um, electrical devices that can be used to treat things like deafness and blindness um, and cardiac infarct. If we bring them together, we're going to end up in this nice space where we have the electrical properties and the ability to interact with tissue, but also the nice supportive environment to um, encourage regeneration at the same time. Um, we started in this space uh, by looking at conductive polymers and for I don't know if there's any PhD students online, but um, this is effectively a summary of my PhD, which is we thought conductive polymers were going to be great. They are inherently conductive because they pass charge in both electrons and ions, which means they can mediate that communication between hardware and tissues. Um, they have this increased tissues of this increased surface area, which means they not only pass charge very efficiently, but the roughness gives cells something to integrate with. And they're very easily polymerized. Um, they kind of exist as no, nothing to be said about, you know, clever abilities to make them. Um, they, they've been known to, to work since um, they were discovered in the 1950s. People have really just been modifying, doing chemical modifications and um, swapping and changing out uh, bits and pieces to try and make them more compatible with the body and more tolerated um, in terms of having mechanical compliance and biofunctionality. Um, the summation of my PhD was effectively, there are many things you can do to conduct in polymers, but please don't do them. They do terrible things at the same time. Um, so uh, this was one of my, one of the pictures that came out of my thesis was, was if you start, if you start to add, to add um, um, matrix, matrix proteins and things, and things to, Somebody's got an echo in there if you could mute, thanks. Um, if you start to add uh, matrix proteins or growth factors and all the nice biological things to conduct in polymers to get this great combination of electrical and biological, what actually happens is that they become very, very brittle. They become very friable and uh, if you try and implant them, you end up with pieces of conducting polymer floating around in the body, not where you want them at all. Um, further more than that, that they they can be fabricated by two routes. Neither of them enable you to post fabricate them into something else. So they don't have great capacity for um, printing, uh, electro spinning. There's people who've done some really clever things, but not with conductive polymers purely on their own. So we're just going to briefly go into a little bit of work we did very early on in electrode coatings. So we worked with what we had and that was we knew we can make conducting polymers very easy as a coating on an electrode. Um, and this is just an example of some of the devices that we've, we've worked with. We worked with cochlea for a number of years and made um, conductive hydrogels. We worked with the Bionic Eye Institute in Australia and made some uh, bionic eye devices that had uh, coatings. And more recently, we've been working with Galvani here in the UK uh, to put coatings onto um, peripheral nerve interfaces. But we didn't use straight up conducting polymers because we knew mechanically that they wouldn't stand the test of time. So what we started here was working composites where we took hydrogel bases uh, and grew our conducting polymers within the hydrogels. The hydrogel we worked with was this, was this uh, sulfonated polyvinyl alcohol. And um, um, a very conventional conductive polymer called the PIGO. The charge by sulfonating the polyvinyl alcohol enabled us to grow the conducting polymer just within the hydrogel coating. And so we end up with an ability there to tailor the mechanics, make them softer, while still getting that good charge conductivity that you get from um, a conductive polymer. So this has sort of stepped us off into the area of composites, tried to get us the best of both worlds. We're always in this space playing between a trade off of properties and we want the ideal design criteria of soft, squishable, can interact really well with the, the usually the nervous system, um, but also conductive um, and long term stability from a uh, mechanical and electrical point of view. Um, and so this is really, really a bunch of work we did that showed we can modify existing devices, but that doesn't allow us to really step into the next generation of materials. Um, 
and they're all inherently bound to that mechanical, uh, that metal substrate underneath. So you still end up with your having to make all of your devices with platinum electrodes and you don't get past the, the, the bottleneck of um, how big you can make a platinum electrode, the fact that you still have this stiff component that doesn't uh, flex within your device. Um, so the next thing that we moved on to and what I really want to talk about is how we're trying to make flexible electronics. Um, so flexible electronics is where we're trying to entirely remove the metallic component of our device. Um, and what we want to do there is make devices that are purely polymeric, that stretch and flex with the body, that have the best of both worlds. Um, we started off doing this with a uh, PDOT PSS suspension. So PDOT it is probably the most well-known conducting polymer, but as a processable solution, they made this PDOT PSS suspension that's represented here in the, um, the uh, molecular model. Um, the PSS dopes the PDOT so that it is, you know, uh, stably conductive, but to make it a solution that was processable and could be mixed with other materials. Uh, the commercial people who make it, um, it's made by a number of companies now, put in an excess of the polystyrene sulfonate. So the polystyrene sulfonate or PSS is there to facilitate the solubility, to facilitate dispersion, um, and to also dope the PDOT. What's been really interesting about this is that we, as well as some other people, um, in that we uh, collaborate with and know in this space, learnt very quickly that this excess of PSS can also cause toxicity. So it's not the best when it comes to implants um, and biomedical uh, interactions, but there's also been some people who've cleverly figured out how to remove the excess of, of PSS once you've formed your device or your material um, to remove the toxic uh, effects of that PSS. What we wanted to do was to make these conductive elastomers. We used what we learnt from conductive hydrogels that are um, adhered to metals to make these freestanding films. And so these are just um, cast films where we've uh, loaded polyurethanes uh, with polystyrene sulfonate, uh, with PDOT PSS um, into sheets to then try and make them into electrode arrays for peripheral nerve cuffs. This was our first step into trying to show that we could make um, elastomers which are commonly used as insulators, conductive enough to be electronic devices. So we basically take our conductive polymer with its intrinsic electric electrical performance and combine it with a polyurethane elastomer which has mechanical flexibility and also easy, easy processing. So these are things that can actually not just be cast into films but also be extruded and thermally processed once you've made uh, your base material. We chose a polyurethane that is used in cardiac pacemaker leads so that we knew we had some um, inherent uh, cytocompatibility and that then everything as we modified it from our conductive polymer point of view would, would be brought on, on from that and we knew that, that the polyurethane shouldn't be significantly affected by that combination. So we made these conductive elastomers that were fully organic, flexible um, and they were electroactive as well. Characterising them, we found um, that probably not surprisingly that as we increased the amount of PDOT, so this is an increase from 5 weight percent down to 25 weight percent of PDOT in polyurethane, that we got a reduction in our impedance. Um, and when we compared that to a, a sheet of platinum of the same size, you can actually see the platinum has this um, behaviour which is indicative of the way that it passes electricity. So this is capacitive behaviour shown by the impedance and uh, here the um, phase of the uh, impedance uh, electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. So this is showing capacitive charge transfer which is that where you're getting the electrons passed from the electrical material into um, the biological fluid which is effectively saline in this environment. You note the conductive elastomers are actually quite different. They have these very flat impedance profiles and they have the zero degree phase lag for, for the majority of the frequency spectrum. This means that they are able to really efficiently pass electricity 
from the electrical connections at one end through the material into the aqueous environment. Um, they do it a little slower than, plat uh, than platinum. You'll notice that their impedance doesn't actually get down to as low as the platinum in the high frequency region, but in the low frequency region, they actually have quite good performance when we compare them. What's interesting to note here is that right around here is the zone where a lot of bionic devices operate. They operate kind of in that that sort of 100 to 1000 um, hertz zone for stimulation of uh, neural tissue. So we know from this that we can have some comparable performance, but we're not really kicking it out of the um, out of the ballpark yet. Um, similarly, this is uh, the, the cyclic voltammetry of those same materials, which has a very uh, small uh, hysteresis loop at low loading. And as we increase our loading, we get to these really wide hysteresis loops which means we're getting a lot of passage um, of charge every time we sweep the applied voltage, telling us we are very easily communicating with that biological environment. Essentially, the charge storage capacity here that we've mapped out is just the areas in those hysteresis loop for uh, any of you who are not familiar with um, cyclic voltammetry. We note that the platinum here is actually has a very small charge storage capacity. And this is actually the critical part that limits its ability to communicate with neural tissue um, and why people think that conductive polymers, as even at really low loadings, can actually improve on um, traditional metals for, inter for um, communicating with the body. What's interesting about this is that uh, as we increase our loading, those, they're effectively microfibers that are formed by the P.PSS P dot suspension. Those microfibers actually impart a stiffness to um, our polyurethane. So you'll see here that pure polyurethane has this sort of viscoelastic curve that as we increase the loading of the P dot, we actually start to get a material that gets a lot stiffer. Um, and if we look at elongation to failure, um, as we increase our loading, our elongation goes from sort of a 400% stretch with no P dot right down to it's around about um, it's around about 60% um, elongation that you can get before you end up with failure at the 25 weight percent loading. Now we thought that this was a bit disappointing because you're always getting you're always playing a trade off a trade off between your electrical properties and your mechanical properties, and um, what we wanted to be able to do is to reach high stretch and still maintain um, our electrical properties. We have in the subsequent sort of um, couple of years decided that, well, how much stretch do you get in the body? And it depends on where you place your electrodes. So if you're in the brain, actually having this amount of stretch is more than sufficient. Um, you only get sort of, you know, 10 to 20 percent um, stretch in materials, um, stretch in, in neural tissues. If you're near the skeletal muscles or you're looking at um, something like a muscle tissue scaffold, you need a little bit more. But to be honest, you know, if you're getting 200% elongation of failure around here, you're actually not, you're actually getting more than more than sufficient for an implant scenario. What we don't want, though, is that really high stiffness and the softer we get and the closer we get to the stiffness of the material. So here in your Young's modulus, the closer we get to um, a neural tissue stiffness, which is not even on the megapascal scale, we want to get down into kilopascals, um, the better we are going to have for long-term tolerance of the biomaterial. So briefly, we did make some devices out of these materials just to show that we could. Um, but in the efforts of um, moving on and trying to make sure that we, we get to the actual structuring and modifications we've done, um, I just want to point out our conductivities. So these are actually really low um, relative to platinum. So platinum sheet conductivity is on the orders of kilosiemens per centimetre, whereas even our high loadings, which can inject charge very nicely to the body in terms of DC conduction and movement along the material through that insulative polyurethane network, we have quite low conductivity. Um, something around about six siemens per centimetre is achievable with our 28% um, loaded P dot PSS. So we have this trade-off. We did. We expected to have one, but we have quite a big trade-off between DC conduction within the device and charge injection to the biological environment. So the question is, is can we actually get the benefits of um, both conductivity 
in the DC as well as the charge injection and how might we be able to make better conductivity within these materials. So we hypothesized we had an incomplete connection between our particles um, due to the dispersion of PDOT within the polyurethane. Um, and that was, we didn't have any ability to play with this because the PDOT PSS was a commercial suspension. Um, and all we were playing with was loading and its interaction with the polyurethane matrix. So where we went from here was how can we improve that percolation or the connection of PDOT throughout our polyurethane? And we thought that if we could get nanostructured pathways, then we could start to get a really nice communication between the two. First of all, we developed um, some nanoparticles. So these were methods that were effectively taken um, from literature and created nanoparticles um, that had sort of 70 to 100 nanometers of diameter and made some sheets um, of conductive elastomer from those. And we also made a nanowire structure. So, um, Straight up, we could see uh, that the nanoparticles were having some agglomeration issues. Even once we cast them into sheets with a lot of um, ions to try and help them disperse, we still had these large sort of blocks. Unsurprisingly, um, our charge storage capacity shot down was very, very low. Our impedance here was extremely high, very noisy and messy, uh, and effectively told us that although we had these sheets which looked that, like they had a nice suspension of nanoparticles in them, um, they were, were clearly not connected. Uh, the particles were aggregated, they weren't touching each other, and we had no um, continuous path for electricity to path through. So then we were working on these nanowires. So the nanowires that we developed um, had diameters of 50 to 100 nanometers um, and micro type lengths. And you did get singular nanowires, uh, but you also got this bundling effect in different places um, as well when you make them, which I'm sure many people who've worked with nanoparticles before are very familiar with are quite hard to disaggregate and disperse. What was nice about these is that these actually had improved properties. The um, impedance of our PDOT nanowires with, um, within our uh, polyurethane was brought right down to something quite um, um, is actually a little bit lower than our original microwires, uh, original microfibers, and um, our charge storage capacities um, were improved significantly over that of the nanoparticles. What's great is we did a lot of work on the conductivity of these, and this is our 25 weight percent microfiber of PDOT PSS in um, polyurethane. And this is our 10 weight percent of nanowires following right up and we were able to load them with much higher weight percents um, to achieve materials over 100 Siemens per centimetre. What's great about this is it starts to give us the tools to create devices that are both electrically conductive as well as able to inject electricity at amounts that are higher and comparable to metal um, devices. We visited um, our UCL compatriots in the LCN and uh, did some contact current um, AFM so that we could look at the connection. And what was great was we could actually start to see where these wire bundles sat within our polyurethane and created continuous paths um, which were enabling that high conductivity. So this is starting to give us some of the tools to map networks of conductive materials through insulators so that we can control that on a very fine scale and achieve materials that um, have high conductivity, as well as all of our other nice properties of being stretchable, um, low mechanical modulus and well tolerated by the body. So I'm just going to finish up there on the conductive elastomer work that we've done to just briefly start to talk about how we can make them into useful devices and why we've had to design yet another set of um, materials to address some of the um, processability. So we know that we have these materials that we can make in sheets. So we're still able to make devices out of those and we can use traditional laser micro machining um, to make those sheets into usable things. We've made them into peripheral nerve cuffs and bionic eye devices. Um, but we can't use some of the more novel techniques, the advanced manufacturing 3D printing um, or extrusion to try and make those into uh, really complex structures that could address um, more interesting, I guess, therapeutic effects. So can we make them into fully polymeric devices that we can print out and make bespoke for different patients? Um, that's required us to start to look at novel conductive molecules and how we can make essentially copolymers um, or composites that are covalently connected 
to enable us again to get that best of both worlds. Can we make something processable as well as conductive? That brings us to our 3D printed conductive polymers. And what's quite well known is that, well, you can't print, sorry, I was missing something. Um, is that while it's nice and you can print hydrogels and normal polymers, conducting polymers such as PDOT, we can't actually print. Um, this really big steric ring structure um, gives them basically a no, no ability to be thermally processed and the solvents that you might use to process them need to be present in quite, um, quite high excess to be able to um, do some sort of solvent extrusion and then you end up dealing with big changes in, in volume, volume and um, or toxicity effects within tissues and other polymers. So um, we've been working with a collaborator in Würzburg um, on melt electrospin writing, and they've been using it to, to create some of these really interesting sort of scaffold type patterns. Um, they can basically vary this when you're talking about things like polycaprolactone um, or polyxazolines, so that you can end up with um, these structures which have up to hundreds of layers and can be varied between sort of eight nanometers right up to hundreds of, of micrometers in um, feature size. Um, it's solvent free, which is nice and particularly amenable to making materials that are compatible with cells. If we can make them without solvents, then we have an ability to um, make a material that's less, you know, you don't then have to put it through a pile of processing to make it clean and able to interact with tissues. So PDOT um, has no melting point. It literally decomposes at a certain point. Um, and we knew from our previous work that it's not flexible, so it's going to be poorly processable. Um, and that was our starting point for working with electro, uh, melt electrospin writing was let's not start with PDOT. Um, what we did do was we designed a few different ways to make structures which had thiophenes, so the conductive part of the PDOT, just the thiophene ring, but um, combined into different structures to impart processability by using oxazolines. Um, and we designed ways of making um, sort of backbone structures of the oxazolines with branched arms of thiophenes. Um, or these ladder structures which tried to make that continual double single bond structure that's required to ensure uh, conductivity of a conductive polymer. So this is our biggest challenge. You need a continuous um, conjugated structure, so a continuous double single bond structure right along the backbone to ensure you have conductivity or at least the high conductivity we need um, for bionic devices. Every time you start to create new branched polymers or um, composites and copolymers, you have a capacity to hinder that process and effectively render your material non-conductive. So we started designing these just little monomers that we thought we could then polymerize to preserve conductivity, but also impart um, processability. And we made a library of them and interestingly discovered a few different ones which um, agglomerated with crystalline regions. The chemists who we work with were very excited about this because um, crystalline oxazolines have not been observed before and adding the thiophene uh, ring structure seems to have enabled them to um, assemble into some crystalline states. So um, we found that we could get good solubility and lots of solvents out of these, which is a stark improvement on thiophenes on their own. Um, they had some low melting points, which was our baseline for um, being able to uh, melt electrospin right them, was the lower the melting point, the better it's going to be. And they need to be stable with um, no side chain reactions uh, that could in, in interrupt that conductivity um, structure once they're polymerized. We tried some basic printing and uh, of some of our first ones. So this is a three thiophene to oxazoline which had a melting point of 40 to 50 degrees and a boiling point of 200 degrees. We printed um, and some of our first structures, we were, well, we were happy because it's the first evidence that we could print them. We we're a little disappointed that they really didn't look anything like those structures that are standardly come out of um, some, you know, pristine mute printing of other polymers. So we then started to look at different combinations of this material. Um, we ran some alternate um, structures where we where we added extra side groups and extra bonding mechanisms 
and looked at a whole pile of glass transition temperatures, the temp temperature we would require to print, and their solubility. We had the idea that we really wanted to preserve the solubility in case we needed to add a little bit of chemical solvent to facilitate good printing. Um, and so we, we've able to, to develop a couple of structures there as well. Um, and ultimately, our second attempt at printing started to yield something that did look like a scaffold. Um, given this was sort of a first attempt, we were very impressed that we were actually able to develop a scaffold, even though you can clearly see there's a lot of um, a lot of blobbing. It's not one of those smooth structures um, that would get you a scaffold you'd want implanted in your body. A few attempts later, um, and by varying the properties that you can see up here, there is a lot of properties you can vary with um, melt electrospin writing. Um, you know, temperature, speed of the head, um, the electric field, pressure of gases that are surrounding the polymer flow. Um, there's a lot of ways in which we can vary those things to try and get a smooth print. And ultimately, we have been able to achieve some nice um, mesh structures. Um, feasibly, we, we'd originally planned that these mesh structures were good scaffolds for muscle tissue scaffolds, um, or even um, skeletal or smooth muscle. But we've also been continuing to look at this in the space of neural cell regeneration as well, where we could impart improved um, conductivity along with these, the um, processability to make bespoke components. So interestingly, um, I'm not even going to show the electrical properties of these because we, we couldn't find, we had really nice materials that we had the potential to be electrically um, conductive, but they had such low electrical conductivity that they weren't really comparable to anything we've worked with before. So we then tried to add additional EDOT into the system, so some additional conductive polymer to make them um, conductive as well as printable. The idea there being that we could post-process them to be more conductive, or we could take essentially the end groups here, which just have thiophenes, and cross-link them into being um, added to being integrated with um, conductive polymers that actually do preserve that uh, conjugated backbone structure. So our first attempts, I think all we managed to do is form a lot of conductive polymer on the outside of the scaffold. Um, and while this is actually, you know, it's a feasible way of imparting conductivity to a structured scaffold, um, it's, if that was all I was doing, I wouldn't go about it this way. Um, the material that forms on the outside is still very brittle and doesn't solve any of our mechanical problems that we talked about earlier. So we then looked at making some bundles. What you can note here is these are beautiful, smooth printed structures. Um, we're getting much better at printing these. And we know they've got the building blocks in them for conducting polymers. They may not have really good conductivity just yet, but this is our starting point. And with these bundles, we were actually able to get conductive polymer to impregnate within the bundles. And um, we we're able to get those to um, form conductive polymer structures. So this smooth surface, we take the bundle and dip it into some extra conductive polymer monomer, and then put it into an oxidant to enable those to cross-link with the structure. Um, so here we end up forming some neat conductive polymer, but we also end up integrating conductive polymer into the fibres and actually creating a conductive structure. We still need to work on this from a mechanical point of view. Um, they still are not as uh, flexible and soft as we would like. But again, we have a pathway whereby we know we can get some more conductive um, monomers into the material system and gives us a, a way of um, tailoring that conductive property. So we've got multiple variables that we can play with here in terms of our original monomer that we created to print, the oxidant that we're using and how much and the order we place it in, and then also um, the monomer that we could use to create extra conductive polymer within these scaffolds. Um, we do believe that at this point we're going to need extra conductive polymer in this scaffold. We can't make pure conductive materials purely of the um, 3 thiophene oxazine because we don't have that continuous structure along the backbone of those thiophene units that will enable conductivity. So um, to summarise this part, we know that we've developed lots of new monomers and building blocks to play with of the thiophene and the oxazoline. They are processable and printable, and this is the first time that it's been um, shown that you can actually um, print 
these conductive polymer components using a mu printing approach. Um, but we've still got a lot of work to go on the conductivity aspect um, while preserving the mechanics. Luckily, we have some experience in that and we'll be taking this one forward in the next uh, next bit to um, figure out how to best impart both of those materials up, um, into devices. So I'm going to leave it there since I believe I'm now out of time. Um, and just going to thank uh, Joseph Godding, um, Chris Chapman, both of who are postdocs in my group who um, work up and head up a lot of this work. Julian Heck, who's a PhD student who worked on the um, fire phenox azazine work, and Estelle Kutaz, who has um, made all of the um, conductive elastomer work, um, basically work, and our collaborators at the University of Würzburg. Thank you. Any questions? Thanks. Thank you very Thanks much, Ryan. Really interesting, interesting talk. talk. Um, um, can, can, 